Bloodletting One of the most infamous medical practices in history dates back to ancient civilizations such as Egypt and Greece, where it was rooted in the humoral theory of medicine. This theory posited that the human body contained four essential fluids, or humors. Blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. And that health depended on their balance. If a person was ill, it was believed their humors were imbalanced, often due to an excess of blood. To address this, physicians used tools such as lancets or relied on leeches to extract blood from patients, sometimes targeting veins closest to the supposed source of the ailment. The practice was not without its risks and controversies. Bloodletting often weakened patients, sometimes to the point of death, especially in cases where it was performed repeatedly or excessively. During the Middle Ages, it became so popular that barber surgeons, easily recognizable by their red and white barber poles, took on the task, often without formal medical training. Even renowned historical figures like George Washington were subjected to aggressive bloodletting. In Washington's case, excessive blood removal during his final illness is believed to have hastened his demise. Despite the visible harms, this practice persisted for centuries because it was deeply entrenched in medical tradition and authority. It wasn't until the 19th century that bloodletting fell out of favor as medical understanding advanced. The rise of germ theory and scientific experimentation revealed that many diseases were caused by pathogens rather than humoral imbalances. Furthermore, statistical studies began to show that bloodletting was largely ineffective and often detrimental. Today, it serves as a sobering reminder of how medical practices once rooted in tradition can persist long after they've been proven harmful. Modern medicine occasionally uses therapeutic phlebotomy for specific conditions like hemochromatosis, but this is a far cry from the indiscriminate bloodletting of the past. Trepanation One of the earliest known surgical procedures involved drilling or scraping a hole into the human skull. Evidence of this practice dates back over 7,000 years, with archaeological findings of trepanned skulls across ancient cultures in Europe, South America, and Africa. The reasons behind trepanation varied widely. Some believed it was a way to release evil spirits causing illness, while others saw it as a treatment for head injuries, epilepsy, or mental disorders. Remarkably, many trepanation patients survived, as evidenced by bone regrowth around the drilled openings. The methods and tools used in trepanation were crude by modern standards. Practitioners employed sharp stones, flint knives, or later metal instruments to bore into the skull, often without any form of anesthesia. Despite the potential for infection and severe pain, survival rates were surprisingly high, possibly due to the meticulous care taken in the procedure. In some cultures, trepanation was not limited to medical purposes, it held ceremonial or spiritual significance, with trepanned skulls believed to symbolize healing or power. The holes were sometimes deliberately left open, and in rare cases, decorative stones or ornaments were placed in them. Although trepanation fell out of mainstream medical use with the advancement of neurosurgery, it has had a strange afterlife in alternative medicine. In the 20th century, some proponents claimed that trepanation could enhance cognitive function or relieve depression by increasing blood flow to the brain, a theory with no scientific basis. Today, trepanation stands as a haunting testament to humanity's early attempts to understand and intervene in the mysteries of the brain, blending medical curiosity with superstition and survival instincts. Lobotomy a procedure that involves severing connections in the brain's prefrontal cortex is one of the most infamous and controversial practices in medical history. Popularized in the 20th century as a treatment for severe mental illnesses such as schizophrenia, depression, and anxiety, lobotomies were initially seen as a groundbreaking innovation. Dr. Antonio Agus Moniz, a Portuguese neurologist, developed the procedure in the 1930s and won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1949 for his work. However, the benefits were questionable, and the consequences for patients were often catastrophic. The procedure itself was both invasive and brutal. Early methods involved drilling holes into the skull to access the brain, while later iterations, such as the transorbital lobotomy, popularized by Dr. Walter Freeman, used an ice pick-like instrument inserted through the eye socket. The intent was to disrupt neural pathways thought to contribute to mental illness. While some patients exhibited a reduction in distressing symptoms, the side effects were profound. Many were left in a vegetative state, unable to function independently, or suffered from drastic personality changes. Despite these outcomes, lobotomies became widely performed, with an estimated 50,000 procedures carried out in the United States alone. The decline of lobotomies coincided with the rise of psychotropic medications in the mid-20th century, which offered less invasive and more effective ways to treat mental health disorders. Today, the lobotomy is viewed as a dark chapter in psychiatric history, 
highlighting the dangers of overconfidence in untested medical interventions. Mercury Treatments For centuries, mercury was a cornerstone of medical treatment, hailed as a cure-all despite its toxic properties. Its use dates back to ancient China and India, where it was believed to have rejuvenating and purifying effects. By the Renaissance and into the 19th century, mercury became a popular treatment for syphilis, a widespread and often deadly sexually transmitted infection. Physicians would prescribe mercury ointments, pills, or even vapor treatments, claiming it purged the body of impurities. However, these treatments often left patients debilitated or dead, as the mercury poisoning caused symptoms far worse than the disease it aimed to treat. The effects of mercury on the body were devastating. Patients often experienced severe side effects, including excessive salivation, tremors, loss of teeth, and cognitive decline, a condition later dubbed Mad Hatter Syndrome due to its prevalence among hat makers who used mercury in their craft. Despite these alarming outcomes, the demand for mercury treatments persisted, partly because syphilis had no other known cure at the time. Physicians clung to the belief that mercury's visible effects, like the shedding of skin, signified the body expelling disease. The decline of mercury in medicine came with the rise of scientific inquiry and the discovery of safer, more effective treatments, such as penicillin in the 20th century. However, its legacy lingers as a cautionary tale in medical history. While modern medicine no longer uses mercury therapeutically, its toxic properties remain a concern in environmental and occupational health. Phrenology a pseudoscientific practice that gained popularity in the 19th century claimed that the shape and contours of a person's skull could reveal their personality traits, intelligence, and even moral character. Developed by Franz Joseph Gall in the late 1700s, phrenology was based on the belief that different areas of the brain corresponded to specific traits, and that the size of these areas, visible as bumps or depressions on the skull, determined the strength of those traits. Despite its lack of scientific validity, phrenology became a cultural phenomenon, influencing medicine, education, and even criminal justice. Phrenologists use specialized charts to divide the skull into dozens of regions, each associated with a particular trait, such as benevolence, combativeness, or amativeness, sexual desire. Practitioners would run their hands over a person's skull, noting its bumps and indentations, and then provide a detailed analysis of their character. While phrenology was initially seen as a tool for self-improvement and career guidance, it soon took on more sinister applications. Some proponents used it to justify racial and class-based discrimination, claiming that certain skull shapes were indicative of inherent inferiority or criminal tendencies. The decline of phrenology began in the late 19th century as advances in neuroscience and psychology debunked its core assumptions. It became clear that personality and behavior were far more complex than the simplistic mapping of skull features. However, the influence of phrenology lingered, shaping early studies in neuroscience and criminology. Today, it serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of conflating pseudoscience with legitimate research, highlighting the need for rigorous evidence in the pursuit of understanding the human mind. Corpse medicine, a practice that involved using human remains as treatments, was surprisingly common in Europe from the Renaissance through the 18th century. Physicians and apothecaries believed that consuming parts of the human body could transfer the deceased's vitality or cure various ailments. Ingredients ranged from powdered skulls to human fat and blood, with each thought to possess unique healing properties. This macabre form of medicine was rooted in the belief that the human body was a potent source of life energy and, when consumed, could restore health. One of the most popular remedies was mummy powder, made from ground-up ancient Egyptian mummies, which was believed to treat everything from headaches to internal bleeding. Fresh human blood was also sought after, often taken from executed criminals, as it was thought to cure epilepsy. The fat of the dead, collected during autopsies or executions, was turned into salves for wounds and burns. This gruesome practice blurred the line between medicine and superstition, with wealthy Europeans willing to pay handsomely for these treatments. As scientific understanding progressed in the 18th and 19th centuries, corpse medicine fell out of favor. The rise of germ theory and ethical concerns regarding the desecration of human bodies led to its abandonment. Today, corpse medicine is viewed as one of history's most shocking medical practices, reflecting the lengths to which societies would go in their quest for healing. Radium Treatments In the early 20th century, radium was hailed as a miracle substance with supposed health benefits ranging from curing cancer to rejuvenating the body. Discovered by Marie and Pierre Curie in 1898, radium's luminescent properties fascinated the world, and it quickly found its way into consumer products and medical treatments. 
Radium-infused water, toothpaste, cosmetics, and even candy were marketed as elixirs of vitality. Physicians also prescribed radium-based therapies to treat arthritis, fatigue, and other ailments, believing its radiation stimulated bodily functions. Unbeknownst to its advocates, radium exposure caused severe and often fatal health effects. Workers in radium factories, particularly young women who painted watch dials with radium-laced paint, suffered from devastating conditions such as bone fractures, anemia, and necrosis of the jaw, a condition infamously known as radium jaw. These women, later called the radium girls, often licked their brushes to achieve fine lines, unknowingly ingesting the radioactive substance. Despite the mounting evidence of radium's dangers, its use persisted due to aggressive marketing and limited scientific understanding of radiation's long-term effects. The turning point came in the 1920s and 1930s when lawsuits brought by the Radium Girls highlighted the devastating consequences of radium exposure. Public awareness grew and regulations began to restrict its use. By the mid-20th century, radium treatments were replaced by safer, evidence-based medical technologies. While radium's early promise ended in tragedy, it played a crucial role in advancing our understanding of radiation, ultimately paving the way for safer applications in cancer therapy and other medical fields. The Wandering Womb In ancient Greek and Roman medicine, the concept of the wandering womb was a widely accepted explanation for various physical and mental ailments in women. Physicians like Hippocrates and later Galen believed that the uterus was a mobile organ that could move freely within a woman's body, causing symptoms such as hysteria, fainting, and even choking sensations. This idea was rooted in the belief that the womb, if left unanchored by pregnancy, would wander in search of moisture, disrupting other organs in its path. The proposed treatments for this condition ranged from the bizarre to the invasive. Physicians would prescribe fumigation where fragrant or foul-smelling substances were used to lure the womb back to its proper place, believing it was drawn to pleasant smells and repelled by unpleasant ones. In other cases, women were instructed to marry and conceive as a way to keep the uterus occupied. Hysterectomies, often performed without proper anesthesia or sanitation, were also occasionally suggested as a more extreme solution. These practices not only reflected medical ignorance, but also reinforced societal biases, framing women's health as inherently linked to their reproductive role. The wandering womb theory persisted for centuries, influencing medical practice well into the Renaissance and beyond. It wasn't until the advent of modern gynecology in the 19th century that this myth was debunked, replaced by a more accurate understanding of female anatomy and physiology. Tobacco Smoke Enemas in the 18th and early 19th centuries, one of the strangest medical treatments to gain popularity was the tobacco smoke enema. Believed to have resuscitative and curative properties, this practice involved blowing smoke into a patient's rectum, often using a bellows. Originally used to revive drowning victims, it was later touted as a treatment for a variety of conditions, including colds, respiratory ailments, and even abdominal cramps. The idea was that tobacco's stimulating effects would invigorate the body and restore vital functions. Tobacco smoke enemas became widely practiced along the rivers of Europe and America, where drowning incidents were common. Physicians would carry portable kits specifically designed for this purpose, and the treatment was even endorsed by prominent medical societies. However, the science behind it was dubious at best. Tobacco contains nicotine, a potent stimulant, but introducing it into the body via smoke often led to adverse effects such as nausea, dizziness, and even poisoning. Despite this, the practice persisted for decades due to its association with cutting-edge medical innovation. The decline of tobacco smoke enemas coincided with advancements in medical knowledge and the discovery of more effective resuscitation techniques such as chest compressions and artificial respiration. By the mid-19th century, the practice was largely abandoned and is now remembered as a bizarre footnote in the history of medicine. Electroconvulsive therapy, first introduced in the 1930s, was a groundbreaking yet controversial treatment for severe mental illnesses, including depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. The procedure involved sending controlled electrical currents through the brain to induce a seizure, which was thought to reset the brain's chemistry. ECT was initially celebrated as a revolutionary alternative to lobotomies and other invasive treatments, but its early methods were crude, often leaving patients with severe side effects, such as memory loss, confusion, and physical injuries from convulsions. In its early days, ECT was administered without anesthesia or muscle relaxants, making the experience traumatic for patients. The violent seizures it induced sometimes resulted in broken bones or dislocated joints. Despite these risks, the practice gained popularity as many patients did show signs of improvement in their mental health. 
However, the lack of understanding about how ECT worked, combined with its dramatic and often distressing side effects, led to widespread fear and stigma surrounding the treatment. It became a symbol of the harshness of early psychiatric care. Over time, ECT underwent significant refinement. By the late 20th century, the use of anesthesia and muscle relaxants made the procedure safer and more humane. Modern ECT is carefully controlled and is considered a highly effective treatment for certain conditions when other therapies fail. Despite its improved safety and efficacy, ECT still carries a heavy stigma due to its history and portrayal in popular media. It serves as a powerful reminder of both the potential and the perils of psychiatric innovation, emphasizing the importance of ethical standards and patient care in medical advancements.